Are you live streaming this? Yes. I'm already going to show the time and all the time is Cool. Live streamed and then archived. So what's the official snow here? Right? Do we have a no? Do we have a no how many people log in through the live stream? Uh, currently there's one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I mean at times we'll have 15, I have like 20. Right. But I didn't look at it until 10. I didn't look at it until 10. It looked like 6. So it was oh, 2 now. Very bad. Well, that was showing about a quarter. So it'll be at least four. Oh, you're just Okay, hello, welcome. It is my great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Letty Roach, who is visiting us today from New York City. Um, Letty is a Scot by <laughs> origin, is that right? Yes. Yeah. So, grew up in Scotland and uh, did her. MPhys, Master of Physics at the University of Scotland, then went all the way to the other end of the world and did a PhD with Sam Dean and James Renwick in New Zealand at the University of Victoria and the National Institute of Water and Atmosphere. Atmosphere. And um, then decided that she was going to go for her postdoc to the US. Or was that the decision, or less? Mm -hmm. And well, and so that's why I know her because I was looking at the time at the time for a postdoc, and she very briefly considered working with me, and uh, then uh, very much um, astutely reconsidered and decided <laughs> yes, to, to work with CC Bits and got into the University of Washington in Seattle. Um, but I was fortunate enough that the discussions that we had. Uh, motivated Letty to apply for a Antarctic Fellowship, a SCAR Fellowship that she was awarded, and so we have been working together uh, ever since then, and so it's my, yeah, I'm very excited that you're here today. Um, she just moved to join the NASA GIS slash Columbia uh, modeling group in New York City. So without further ado, welcome. Yes. Well, thank, thank you for the introduction and, and thanks for having me here. It's been, been really fun to meet with a few of you today. Um, so today I'm going to talk about Antarctic sea ice in a hierarchy of models. Um, and I'm going to talk about three different studies that I've been a part of, uh, but opening with an overview of Antarctic sea ice uh, before getting into the details of those uh, three studies. Uh, so. Let me start uh, by orienting you a little bit to the Southern Hemisphere in case you're not used to, to thinking about the South Pole. So this is an image based on satellite data of the 2020 winter sea ice maximum. Here is the, the sea ice with the concentration shown as white going down to blue for open ocean. And so you can see that the Antarctic pack ice is quite heterogeneous. There's quite a lot of, kind of interesting features in here. And in the winter, it, it covers a really huge area. This uh, aerial extent is, is about the size of Russia. But there's a really large seasonality to the sea ice too. In the summer, it shrinks back to cover uh, to, to, to very little, really. So uh, it changes in uh, six-fold in area over the, over the course of the year. And if we zoom in, there's a lot of complexity in the sea ice itself. Uh, these are pictures that were all taken during uh, the autumn in the Antarctic. Uh, showing different types of sea ice. Um, this top is the top left is grease ice. Uh, these thin streaks of frazzle crystals that form when uh, the ocean surface gets really cold. And then, if there are waves present when the sea ice is forming, they might be pushed together and form pancake flows, which are the, the center picture. So here, the waves have uh, been pushing pieces of sea ice together so that they, as they um, as they freeze together, they actually develop these upturned uh, edges on the side of the wet pancakes. Or if the sea surface is flat and the conditions are calm, you might develop nylas, this very thin sheet ice that's quite dark. And then uh, as the winter goes on, that will grow down in thickness. Uh, the picture on the bottom left is, is showing a, a, a sheet of ice that's been formed by pancakes freezing together, coagulating. Uh, and then in the, in the bottom in the middle, these are pressure ridges where uh, sheets of 
sheets, as you guys have collided together and uh, these little piles of rubble have formed. And then this last picture is when we were sailing out uh, from Antarctica back, going back north. This is actually the first day that we saw the sun again after a couple of weeks of polar night. And here the sea ice has been broken up by ocean surface waves to create uh, flows of different sizes. And a large part of my PhD was uh, working on modeling the processes that uh, create the sizes of these flows and how they might impact sea ice. Um, and then zooming back out, this figure shows the annual average uh, sea ice area from satellite observations, which we have going back to 1979, just the total aerial coverage of sea ice. Um, and you can see over the 40-year-plus over the record that we have now, there's been this sort of increasing trend until we've had recent lows, uh, really large uh, lows, particularly in 2016. Uh, so there's been this uh, very large interannual variability. And uh, it's also worth noting that this uh, trend is, is uh, the overall result of different things happening in different areas. Uh, and if we look at the sea ice concentration trend in February, for example, in observations, you can see that we've had this dike of, of increases in the Waddell and decreases in the Ammenhausen and Bellinghausen seas. Oh, and I don't have this on my figure, but uh, just now, in uh, February 2022, we had a new record low in Antarctic sea ice, which I think uh, we're still working on understanding. Uh, so here I'm now showing the annual average Arctic sea ice area from satellites on top of this figure, just to highlight how um, how large that interannual variability is in the Antarctic. And you can also see that while we've had this kind of interesting trend behavior in the, in the Antarctic, generally the Arctic sea ice descent has been, been a lot steeper. But you haven't seen this uh, such a large interannual drop in the sea ice in the Antarctic as we've seen in the Arctic. Of course, the Antarctic is a very different place from the Arctic. The geography is totally different. We have our very high Antarctic continent. It's very cold, surrounded by open ocean, whereas the Arctic has um, all of these constraints of the land masses uh, in the different areas. And so, because of that geography, Antarctic sea ice is exposed to some of the planet's uh, largest waves and strongest winds. It's also generally understood to be uh, limited by the Antarctic circumpolar current, this strong current that runs around the edge of the continent. Uh, as you can see on this figure, which shows the ocean surface temperatures. And it also has some uh, interesting interactions with the Antarctic ice sheet that we're still working on understanding, both in terms of the sea ice acting as a, a potential buffer in, in uh, uh, the ocean force retreat of uh, Antarctic ice shelves, but also uh, being influenced by the fresh water coming off the Antarctic ice sheet. And so there are a number of complex interactions with the ocean and atmosphere. Uh, for example, an impact on ocean circulation. When uh, sea ice freezes, it ejects brine, which sinks down and promotes mixing in the ocean. And then uh, when it melts, it becomes a source of fresher water. Um, and if the sea ice has traveled during that period, then it's, uh, it's acting as a, as a source of fresh water elsewhere, promoting stratification. And so because of this, sea ice is thought to, to play an important role in the ocean circulation, particularly uh, in pollinias around the Antarctic continent, where we have very active sea ice formation happening, uh, driving uh, mixing and, and the formation of Antarctic bottom water, which circulates globally. Uh, another kind of well-known sea ice process is the sea ice ocean albedo feedback, uh, which very simply, uh, because sea ice is uh, very reflective, it reflects insulation, uh, and if it uh, melts away, the ocean is able to absorb more insulation and enhance uh, sea ice melt. And uh, I guess a slight um, difference here to the Arctic is for this feedback in the Arctic, we often think of changing surface properties, such as the formation of melt ponds. But the system in the Antarctic is, is a little bit different. Most of the melting happens through the ocean, and so, uh, and it's also quite heterogeneous in concentration. So the surface properties don't change so much during the, the melt season. It's more this opening of ocean water that has a big role in this feedback process. And here's just uh, an example of a recent study uh, that quantified the impact of those recent years of Antarctic sea ice loss on the global snow and ice albedo feedback, finding that the Antarctic sea ice 
contributed quite strongly there. Uh, sea ice is also very dynamic. Um, it is uh, driven principally by the wind, um, and uh, typically uh, in free drift moves at around 2% of the wind speed. And in the southern hemisphere, that's happening to the left of the wind direction. And so this has been previously thought to kind of have some uh, play play a role in some uh, sea ice behavior. For example, um, we have uh, we typically have strong westerly winds encircling the Antarctic continent, resulting in a northward Ekman drift as the ice edge expands. And so that's thought to play quite a large role in the sea ice in the large sea ice seasonality, in the big change. Um, partly because as we uh, uh, drift, it, it sea ice drifts northwards during the cold season, this may allow the increased formation of, of sea ice in those open water patches, uh, so it, expanding sea ice. But it's, it's not a very clear picture, and um, Till's recent study looked at how sea ice drift can influence sea ice area and volume, finding different impacts in different uh, seasons. Okay, so now I want to move on to the first study uh, that I'm going to talk about today, where we looked at the representation of Antarctic sea ice in new coupled climate models. So uh, global climate models, of course, describe the physics of the atmosphere, ocean, and the land surface. Uh, these might be different uh, model components, as shown in the schematic that interact through a coupler. And they, are, they have uh, forcings, including uh, greenhouse gases, such as uh, including greenhouse gases, anthropogen anthropogenic aerosols. Uh, they can be influenced by uh, volcanic eruptions and solar variability. There are uh, a number of different kind of complex and nonlinear interactions between various components of the climate system on different timescales in these models. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about results from the uh, CNIP. Uh, project, a couple modeled into comparison project, which uh, provides a standard experimental protocol to be able to compare these different models where they use uh, similar forcings, um, the same forcings for the different models, uh, historical forcings to 2014, and then following different scenario pathways after that. So if we compare models over the historical period, the differences between those models, and not, not due to the forcings, but just due to model uncertainty and uh, internal variability, the uh, inherent noise fluctuations in the climate system. The latest phase uh, was seen at six, which fed into the sixth assessment report and has around 14 or so models contributing. And then we had seen at five uh, before that in the graph 2012, and seen at three in 2005. And um, I don't. Uh, I don't want to be uh, kind of negative about these couple of climate models. I feel like um, they are hugely interesting to me. I'm, I'm always surprised at how well they do at simulating so many aspects of our climate system when it is so complex. But one area that they've historically struggled with has been the simulation of Antarctic sea ice. And this uh, quote is from the fifth IPCC assessment report uh, that found that there was low confidence in climate model projections for Antarctic sea ice due to the wide intermodal spread and the inability of almost all of the available models to reproduce the mean annual cycle, interannual variability, and overall increase of the Antarctic sea ice observed during the satellite era. Incidentally, there was um, a bit of media coverage around the time of this report, including headlines like this from the Daily Mail. Uh, Global warming computer models confounded as Antarctic sea ice hits new record high. And uh, this was around the time that I discovered uh, sea ice climate science and started to get interested in some of these questions. So in our study, uh, this, uh, this was something that I led uh, in 2019 to 2020, together with a group of uh, folk from, the, uh, from two different uh, projects, the Sea Ice Modeling into Comparison Project, and also the Antarctic Climate of the 21st Century Project. And what we wanted to do here was simply to evaluate the representation of Antarctic sea ice in CMIP-6 in these historical experiments. And a lot of the hard work here was really just managing the data from all of these different models uh, and wrangling with that. So in, um, in our study, uh, we took these uh, 40 models, and these are the thin green lines shown in this uh, figure. This is the 
the mean historical sea ice area over 1979 to 2014. Uh, there are three satellite products shown in black. Um, these differ a little bit for sea ice area due to some uncertainty in the algorithms used to process the, the satellite data. Um, but you can see straight away that there is huge uh, intermodal spread between these uh, different different models, although the multi-model mean, which is the, the dashed line, uh, lines up fairly well with the observations. Uh, and so to compare this to previous generations, uh, we synthesized uh, these uh, and basically looked at, uh, we focused on September and February being the maximum and minimum of the CI cycle. And we condensed uh, the, uh, the data from all of these models into box plots. So, this uh, green box plot for CMIP6 uh, shows the spread across these 40 different uh, CMIP6 models uh, for September. And then I have the observations as crosses. And then we did the same thing for the previous generation, CMIP5 and CMIP3. And so you can see that the, uh, the mean agrees fairly well with the observations. Um, and uh, compared to the previous generations, there's been a reduction in the intermodal spread. So broad consistency in September, uh, but then we also see a, a fairly consistent underestimation of the CS area minimum in February. I'll just uh, quickly show some of the spatial distributions of CS concentration. Uh, this isn't the whole set of the models, but just to give you a little bit of, of a sense of the, the variability between the models. Um, so again, this is September and February, and I have the observations as the top three box plots here. Um, so you can see there's, there's quite a bit of variability, in, including some models that are really, uh, really far outliers that have uh, very little winter sea ice here, and then uh, it's completely absent in the in their simulation of the summer. But e even so, this is still more consistent with one another than the previous generations of CMIP models. And we can use the integrated ice area error to synthesize areas in the spatial distribution of sea ice. And so here, um, this is an error, so there's no observations on this figure. Uh, and you can see that uh, as compared to CMIP5, there's been a, uh, a fairly modest improvement. So this area has reduced a little bit. Um, the intermodal spread is a bit more reduced, but we still have some, some outliers. We also looked at the interannual variability. Uh, this is the standard deviation of the sea ice area time series again in September and February uh, versus the observations. And so we found that the models broadly capture the year-to-year -year variability uh, seen in the observations. And then um, what has interested the sea ice community for a long time is, is the trends in, in Antarctic sea ice area. Uh, so as a reminder, here is this, this full-time series. And for our model observation comparisons, we, um, we used 1979 to 2018. Uh, so over this period, the trend is, is slightly positive, uh, but it's not statistically significant. Uh, and the trends from the three uh, observational products here are shown as a black dashed lines versus a histogram of the models in green. Um, and so uh, the, the observations are right on the edge of the histogram of all of these uh, sea ice area trends in both September and February. And this isn't really very surprising, particularly when you look at the trend in the sea ice area as a function of the trend in global mean surface temperature in these CMIP6 models, uh, which I'm showing here. So again, the observations are these black uh, squares. Uh, and so um, in CMIP6, many of the many of the coupled models have had a faster warming than we've seen in the observations. Um, and so it's not really surprising that they're simulating quite strong strong losses in Antarctic sea ice over this period, suggesting that the, the sea ice area trend mismatch relates in large part due to um, model climate sensitivity rather than processes specific to the polar regions. Um, so next, I want to talk about a second study that I think um, goes a <coughs> bit further towards understanding the difference between the models and observations, particularly in terms of the uh, sea ice trends. Uh, this study uh, was led by Ed Blanchard Rigglesworth, a colleague at the University of Washington, um, and uh, involved myself and Aaron Donahoe at UW and Ching Wedding at the University of uh, California, Santa Barbara. 
And here we wanted to explore the potential roles of uh, winds and sea surface temperatures in explaining the difference in trends between the models and the observations. So we did a series of experiments using the CSM-1, which is a fully coupled CMIP-5 class model. Um, and here I'm showing how that, that baseline uh, model does versus the observation. So that's the same uh, black time series that I showed before. And then in uh, the individual blue lines are members of the CSM-1 large ensemble, which um, is a, a set of 35 members that were all begun in 1920, and their initial, the only difference between these runs is uh, a difference at round off level in their initial conditions. So as they propagate forward, the, um, that, that small difference um, uh, uh, propagates, and eventually we, we come to this uh, set of model simulations that have uh, differences between them arising just due to uh, internal variability. And then the mean of the set of 35 members we take to represent the forced response of those models to, um, to climate change. And so like many of the CMIP-5 and CMIP-6 models, this ensemble shows a downward trend over 79 to 2018. We then uh, did three experiments uh, using the same setup as the CSM-1 large ensemble, but where we nudged the winds in this model towards values from reanalysis. We did this nudging um, above the boundary layer, colds of 45 degrees in both hemispheres. And um, we, uh, we did three ensemble members starting from different initial conditions. Um, and you can see that even though their initial CI states are quite varied, those three members converge quite tightly together uh, for the rest of the simulation. And from about 1992 onwards, they're in uh, pretty close agreement with the observations, including capturing this really, uh, this really big decline in the sea ice that we saw in uh, 2016. And then if we um, plot this, uh, the mean of those three simulations on a similar plot as I showed before, this is the trend in the annual mean sea ice area as a function of the trend in global mean surface temperature. Um, so the, the blue dots are the CSM-1 large ensemble, showing that we get this really uh, wide spread, wide spread uh, in that ensemble arising just, to, in, just due to internal variability. And when we nudge the winds in the model, uh, by, so we're essentially just imposing the observed atmospheric circulation variability, we find that we're still within the envelope of the large ensemble. So these are relatively small changes but that we are now representing one of the, uh, the least negative trends in the CIS area in this ensemble, and actually also uh, one of the, the global mean surface temperature trends that are closest to the observed value. And so if we take the difference between the observations and the large ensemble mean, which represents the false response, we find that the observed wind variability can explain around a third of this difference, which I think is quite significant. We also found that when we applied this wind nudging to the model, which incidentally, I, I didn't say this, but you don't see this kind of pattern of the, the dipole and of sea ice loss and increase in individual CMIP6 models. But when we applied this wind nudging, we found that the experiments do a really good job of capturing spatial patterns in the trends around Antarctica, with the increase in the Waddell and decrease in the Amphouse and Bellinghausen seas in both. This is a uh, top panel is uh, summer in the bottom. Is September showing this uh, zone away three pattern. So we found the winds were definitely a really big part of the story, but then we also looked at the impact of the Southern Ocean SST trends on sea ice. So um, over the historical period, we've seen in the observations um, some really interesting patterns in sea surface temperature, <laughs> uh, especially in the Pacific and around the Southern Ocean which uh, a lot of people are still trying to, I think, uh, investigate a couple, of, um, a couple of potential drivers of the trends in the Southern Ocean that have been, have been discussed in the literature, including the freshwater flux from the Antarctic ice sheet, um, and more recently, the uh, role of eddies in affecting heat transport and uh, the trapping, uh, uh, preventing heat from reaching the Southern Ocean. 
that um, when we look at the CMIP6 models, uh, those models individually typically don't show such a kind of interesting pattern of cooling. And if you take the mean of, of a few models, uh, this is courtesy of a colleague at Columbia, you definitely don't see this cooling uh, anywhere. So you have a much more uniform pattern of warming. And so to try and understand the, uh, the impact of the observed sea surface temperatures on Antarctic sea ice, we um, uh, use our, a similar nudging approach where we nudge the sea surface temperatures towards values from observations. And we did this equatorward of the sea ice edge, so it's approximately this green box of between 40 degrees south and 56 degrees south. Um, and we did this at the same time as nudging the winds, and when we nudge both the winds and the sea surface temperatures, we find we still get that really good um, pattern of, of sea ice uh, uh, loss in, in the sea ice concentration. Uh, and we have a similar, very similar global mean surface temperature, but the, the, um, the sea ice loss, uh, as shown here as the, the orange in those simulations, is much, much closer to observations and comes uh, outside of the CSM1 large ensemble. So we find that together the observed wind variability and the southern ocean SSTs outside of the sea ice edge could explain 70% of the difference between the observations and the uh, CSM1 large ensemble mean. And this is broadly consistent with other studies. Um, there have been a couple of other groups who have taken similar approaches. Uh, uh, Sang et al. 2020 looked at nudging just the southern ocean SSTs and they found some impact on the sea ice. And then Selen Eisenman uh, nudged the ice drift directly rather than the winds. And they also found some uh, similar, less negative trends in uh, Antarctic sea ice. Um, but our conclusion uh, differs a little bit from them in that they suggested that the, uh, the sea ice, um, that biases in the sea ice drift velocity might be responsible for the discrepancy between models and observations. But our experiment suggests that the sea ice in the models is responding appropriately if it's forced by the observed atmospheric circulation, but together with that extra thermodynamic impact of the SST trends. Okay, um, so now I want to move on to the, the main part of the talk, um, and this is looking at the question of what drives is sorry, <laughs> what drives asymmetry in the seasonal cycle of Antarctic sea ice. Can I ask a question first? And I'm sorry that it's naive. Um, if these models are coupled, does the fact that you need to nudge them with observations mean that the coupling mechanisms are a really big potential problem? I think that's a good question. So, I, so I've so i been thinking of it as the, the wind nudging, because those changes are broadly within the range of the large ensemble, mm. that they it's more that we're choosing a particular realization of the internal variability. Um, rather than kind of imposing anything different. So if you did have like an even larger ensemble, maybe you'd get something that looks pretty close to this. We just happen to impose the, the right combination of factors. But for the, um, for the SST trends, that I think that is really indicative of, of broader problems in the models and whether that's to do with um, those, those factors I mentioned. So the, the pressure water from the Antarctic ice sheet isn't typically represented in uh, I should have said that in uh, in global climate models, and so that might be a, a kind of missing process. The other thing is the role of ocean eddies, which um, we don't really capture in the models because they're not high enough resolution. Uh, but yeah, potentially other kinds of biases in the coupling might might okay. be going on there too. Thank you. Since we're on this, um, you chose three initial conditions for the wind nudging. Yeah. Are those initial conditions that are already in the like in yes. your ensemble, because I was wondering whether you could have picked one that is closer to the actual original condition in the in the satellite record. We could have. We we chose them from like a high, medium, and low member of the CSM one large ensemble because we didn't we wanted to just be able to continue the runs without having changed too much. Yeah. But I think that that shows um, that it doesn't matter too much what the initial conditions yeah, are because they converge so quickly. Like this this wind nudging really does constrain a lot of the Okay, any other questions? 
Okay, so uh, what drives asymmetry in the seasonal cycle of Antarctic sea ice? Um, so in the first part, as I mentioned, the trends and this large interannual variability that we see in Antarctic sea ice. But in spite of that large interannual variability, the shape of the seasonal cycle is remarkably consistent. So here I'm showing the sea ice extent. Uh, the black line is a 20-year climatology. And then um, the purple lines are each individual years uh, going from 1979 to present. And so it's really consistent. You can see that there's this more sluggish growth period from the minimum up to the maximum, followed by a fast retreat. And so uh, there's a seasonal asymmetry in the seasonal cycle between slow advance and fast retreat. And this is something that has been noted since the beginning of satellite observations in the late 70s. And there have been a couple of uh, previously proposed mechanisms to explain this. The first of these uh, relates to the ocean. Um, the physics and climate textbook uh, states that in the Antarctic, the warm ocean waters surrounding the Antarctic continent tend to slow down the growth of sea ice in the fall and to speed up the melting of the sea ice in the spring. And they don't have a citation here, but I think this comes from Arnold Golden's 1981 paper, which was based on an energy budget analysis uh, from the fairly limited observations available at the time, where he suggested that there wasn't enough uh, flux available uh, uh, to melt the sea ice as rapidly as it was being melted. And so he suggested that there must be some kind of upwelling of warm deep water in order to achieve this magnitude of sea ice melt. But since then, other studies have argued that such a contribution would be small because the uh, melt water that you produce from the melting of sea ice would act to stabilize the water column. And then a second uh, mechanism was originally proposed by Enomoto and Amura in 1990, relating to the semi-annual oscillation of the atmospheric low-pressure circumpolar trough, or CPT. Uh, so this is a, a, a low-pressure band that encircles the Antarctic continent, uh, and it has this kind of interesting seasonal cycle uh, because of the temperature difference between the ocean and the continent. And the idea is that you have westerlies to the north of this line and easterlies to the south of this line. So they argue that during the spring melt you have a large portion of the sea ice that's uh, located above this line is subject to westerlies, so we have this north northward Ekman drift um, and that acts to promote ice melt because you have more open ocean and you have this accelerated uh, ice albedo feedback. This mechanism has uh, previously been shown to influence the timing of sea ice advance and retreat in the Western Antarctic Peninsula region. Uh, but more recently, it's been gaining traction as an explanation for the asymmetry in the total hemispheric sea ice extent seasonal cycle. In particular, a recent review paper found that the effect of winds and the ice ocean feedback, albedo feedback together work together on an annual basis to create the very regular shape of the seasonal sea ice extent climatology. Uh, so, um, in our study, we um, found some evidence from, from models that, that gave us uh, some motivation to try and systematically investigate this to see if there might be some other explanation for the asymmetry in the seasonal cycle of Antarctic sea ice extent. Uh, this is the project that Till mentioned as um, something that started when I visited him during this uh, SCAR visiting fellowship. Uh, we also worked together, together closely with Ian Eisenman and then Ed blanchard Rigglesworth at UW and Cecilia Bitts, who was my postdoc advisor. And our study on this has just been accepted at Nature Geoscience. So, the seasonal cycle of Antarctic sea ice is asymmetric. I said that already, but here I just wanted to show the sea ice extent. So again, this is a 20-year climatology. And I've shifted the x-axis by six months to emphasize the period of ice retreat. And so I'm showing this against uh, the annual harmonic, which is the dashed lines, uh, just highlighting with the vertical lines, highlighting the maximum and minimum of each uh, seasonal cycle to emphasize the asymmetry. Uh, so in the observations in black, the summer minimum typically occurs on February 24th, and the winter maximum occurs on September 20th. Uh, and so if we define the ice advance and retreat period simply by the days between maximum extent and minimum extent, 
we find that the retreat period is 51 days shorter than the ice advance period. And I'm going to call this metric delta. So for the observations, we have a delta of 51 days. We can look at this in time. Uh, so here I computed this metric for each year of satellite record. And you can see that there is interannual variability, but um, it's fairly consistent asymmetry. The retreat is always faster than ice advance, and there's no statistically significant trend over this period. We also computed this for the CMIP-6 models. Uh, so here the observations are the blue cross, and um, the multi-model mean is this, uh, this second bullet with the error bar showing the intermodal spread. So this is the delta value for, uh, for each value. So here, on the going further right, we have the individual CMEP6 models for any, any model that provided <coughs> daily data over 20 years. And you can see that the, uh, the models do a pretty good job of capturing this. The multi-model mean is uh, 53 days, very close to the observed value. And this, this was kind of our, our, uh, our first clue in a way. So we found that this, this argument was really re uh, agreement was really remarkable given the documented model biases in Antarctic sea ice. So I showed some of these before, this really wide intermodal spread in many different properties of sea ice, including even just the mean values of the seasonal cycle. Um, so it seemed really remarkable to us that uh, these models were able to capture the asymmetry so consistently. We even saw um, evidence of asymmetry when we went back to the CMIP-3 models. So those were the models from 2005 to 2006, uh, which were quite a bit simpler, lower resolution. And um, it is hard, it's hard to look at uh, seasonality in these models because they only provide monthly output. But if we look at the number of months where the sea ice is advancing versus retreating, we found that these models uh, typically simulated uh, five months of retreat or even four months for the rest of the year uh, showing advance. And not all of these models represent the dynamics of sea ice. In some cases, the sea ice is just melting and growing in place. And so um, this suggested to us that perhaps uh, the asymmetry was occurring due to pretty fundamental physical processes, given that it could be simulated by all of these models. And so then we thought it was reasonable to turn to uh, an idealized model to investigate this further that includes only the most central processes. And so we uh, started using the idealized model of sea ice and climate developed by uh, Jorun Till Wagner and Ian Eisenman. It was published in their 2015 uh, Journal of Climate paper. And this model simulates the zonal mean surface temperature and ice thickness as a function of time and latitude. It's essentially an aqua planet. It doesn't have an atmosphere, and it just has one spatial dimension running from equator to pole. In this model, the uh, enthalpy evolves subject to insulation, including albedo that varies as to whether, the, uh, whether we have ocean or sea ice, outgoing long-wave radiation, which is parameterized as a linear function of temperature, uh, heat transport, which is parameterized as a diffusive process, and then there's also uh, a weak ocean heat input. Um, and this is uh, what's uh, typically described as an energy balance model in the literature. And then on top of that, they also included some uh, single column uh, model representation of physics, uh, so that we have different, um, different values of temperature, that the, the temperature evolves uh, with the enthalpy if you have open water, but um, it's uh, held fixed uh, for uh, freezing of ice or uh, melting of ice. So we run this model uh, for 100 years, over 400 grid points, under controlled climate forcing. So there's no, we're not considering any climate change. And we track the uh, spatial evolution of the E equals zero isotherm as a proxy for the sea ice edge. There is um, quite a bit of uh, parameter dependence in a model like this. And so when we change, uh, when we make changes to the model, each time we tune the long wave parameter A, so that the uh, ice edge in the, in the model matches the observed annual mean, zonal mean ice edge, which is about 65 degrees south in the southern hemisphere. Um, and then we use the true present day values for top of atmosphere insulation that are appropriate for the southern hemisphere. And when we did that, 
run the model in, in that configuration, we find that the idealized model seasonality is in really close agreement with the observations. So where we had our delta of 51 days in the observations, we found a delta of 52 days in the idealized model. And we probably spent longer on this than we should have, but it became clear that the, there was a really obvious role for insulation in this. When uh, Intel's uh, 2015 paper, they used an idealized function of insulation that looks like this, um, which is uh, not uncommon in EBM studies. It was also used by Norman Coakley in 1979. And if you use this kind of insulation, uh, you get a nearly symmetric seasonal cycle on sea ice. This is the yellow dot. But when we use the true present day values for uh, top of atmosphere insulation to drive the model, it's then that we get this, um, this uh, value of delta that matches very closely to the observations. And then this figure just shows the, uh, the seasonal cycle of the ice edge in the model, with the black being the true insulation and the yellow the idealized insulation. And you can see that the switch between these two types of insulation has a, has a huge impact on the timing of the uh, minimum sea ice. So to try and really um, get to grips with this, we decided to step back in complexity to see if we could really understand what was driving this asymmetry. And as a first step, we um, took out the, the sea ice from this model. So instead of having our albedo change to represent ice and ocean, we set it just to be its constant open water value. And then we also got rid of the uh, single column thermodynamics to describe the melting and freezing of sea ice, so that now the temperature just evolves uh, as a function of the entropy. Uh, and this is shown as the no ice uh, panel here. And we find that with the idealized insulation, we have a perfectly symmetric seasonal cycle of sea ice. But uh, with the true insulation, we have an asymmetry of 37 days. So it is smaller. Clearly, the sea ice physics has had uh, some role in amplifying that asymmetry, but there's still a large underlying asymmetry um, that we wanted to investigate further. So we took another step back in complexity um, and got rid of the heat transport term by setting d to zero. And we found that this had a really small impact uh, in, this, in this simulation we had a delta of uh, 35 days, so very similar to our 37 days, suggesting that this, the, the heat transport didn't really have much of a, an impact on this problem. Yeah. Is that just heat transport by diffusion, though? Yes. Because you're saying that the eddies earlier could be a big problem. Yes, yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. yeah. It's still, so still with this, this very simple model that's still the kind of asymmetry that we want to be able to explain. Yeah. Um, but it's, so it's still here even when we take the, the heat transport out. But the eddies, I think you were asking about the eddies, those are parameterized diffusively, right? So these are, these are the eddies that you're getting rid of, right? Yeah, but they're, they're, they're parameterized in a very, very simple, yeah. simple way. Yeah. yeah. So there's no eddies once you get rid of the heat. No, I mean that. I just wanted to know if that was only diffusive heat transport, which I think it is, yeah. Yeah, it's a very, a very idealized model. Okay. Um, but we found, yeah, we found that it was it was representing a lot of the, the, the seasonality that we uh, see in the observation. So we think it's it is an appropriate tool to kind of dive down and see if we can. It suggests that there's kind of this, this very simple oh, yeah. driver. That's how the eggs are represented. So with this, so, so no, heat no heat transport, no sea ice. We just have um, we just have the, uh, the evolution of enthalpy with uh, insulation, uh, long wave radiation, and then this is actually just a constant term here uh, on the right hand side. So and so we still find this this uh, this kind of quite large asymmetry of 35 days. What is that ocean heating correspond to? Like physically? Physically. Um, I mean, I, I guess I would think of it more of it as a tuning parameter that's representing a few different processes, so that we can kind of get a get a, an accurate, um, a fairly accurate picture. It, it's just a constant term in this equation, but it's a weak, it's a weak, uh, it's a weak heat input into the model. It's, it's actually a bit of a crutch because this model was designed to represent the Arctic to investigate the Arctic. Mm -hmm. For the Arctic, 
there's a net heat source that is balanced by not, not FB in the tropics, but because the model is designed for high latitudes, you sort of you give up on energy conservation by putting in a slightly artificial upward. <coughs> That's how I do it. Okay. But you can also you can, you can set it to zero because with this now the way you've written it right now right there's an A in that O and R term that's a constant and the F B so there's you know right now it's just a yeah I mean we're thinking about the seasonal cycle and that's just constant yeah constant throughout the year yeah thank you sorry no thanks for the question um, so once we've got rid of that this term this this really is a very simple equation. Um, and really, um, well really it's a series of now uncoupled ordinary differential equations because there's no communication between the different latitudes. So we can um, look at this equation at each latitude um, and look at the seasonal cycle and temperature at that latitude. So before we were looking at asymmetry in, in the seasonal cycle of sea ice, which we were representing as, as um, the, the, the isotherm and how that changed, but now we're just in this figure. We, um, we computed the seasonal cycle of temperature at each latitude and then looked at the seasonal asymmetry in that. So with a, a, an idealized symmetric insulation, this is this yellow line, we have a perfectly symmetric seasonal cycle of temperature. But when you impose the uh, observed true insulation, uh, there's the black line, then we generate asymmetry that, um, that gets uh, increased as we move from equator to, to pole. And I put the observations here as the blue cross uh, at around 65 degrees south. Um, and so we find that the seasonal uh, asymmetry in temperature, which is defined in the same sense as, as, in, as in sea ice extent, so here a positive delta means that we have a, a faster warming than cooling in temperature. We find that our asymmetry in temperature is a, around 34 days uh, at, the, at 65 degrees south, the observed annual mean. Edge. So it suggests that because the seasonal asymmetry in temperature matches the asymmetry in ice extent, that we are able to understand the asymmetry in ice extent just by understanding the asymmetry in temperature in this really simple equation here. So if we zoom in to 65 degrees south, um, this figure on the top right, the uh, blue line shows the true insulation. Uh, and then the yellow dashed line shows the annual harmonic of that, of that cycle. So you can see that compared to the annual harmonic, the true insulation in the blue uh, goes flat during the period of polar night, where the annual harmonic goes negative, and it's also taller and uh, has a narrower summer peak. And then this figure on the right is the seasonal cycle of temperature that arises from that insulation uh, either the true insulation or the annual harmonic when we put it into this equation here. Um, so compared to the annual harmonic, we have these, uh, this kind of interesting pattern of anomalies. So we have a positive anomaly in insulation from November through January where we have this concentrated summer peak in the, in the high latitudes. And you can see from this figure here that this is around the time that we have a faster warming. And then we have a positive anomaly, again, um, in the insulation from May through Jul uh, July, that leads to a slower cooling in the seasonal cycle of temperature. A negative anomaly from August through October that leads to a delay in the onset of warming. And then another negative anomaly from February through April that leads to an earlier onset of cooling. So it suggests it's really very simple that we have this relatively brief an intense midsummer, late, midsummer insulation peak um, during the summer that causes this relatively rapid summer warming and sea ice retreat. And then during the period of polar night, we have uh, low, very low values of insulation that lead to a more gradual winter cooling and sea ice growth. So our main finding is really that we should just expect asymmetry in the seasonal cycle of Antarctic sea ice based simply on the top of atmosphere insulation. Okay, so um, that's the case for the Antarctic, but what about for the Arctic? So obviously the insulation 
is concentrated in the midsummer, and we have polar night in both hemispheres. Um, we uh, uh, applied the top of atmosphere insulation appropriate for the northern hemisphere, also to the full version of Till's idealized model. And there are some hemispheric differences in the insulation due to the current orbital parameters. So we find a slightly different value for the asymmetry. Um, we find that in the Arctic, the ice retreat period is 43 days shorter than the ice advance period. So delta is, is plus 43 days. So asymmetric in the same sense as the uh, southern hemisphere. But, um, so this is from our, from our idealized model. Um, but when we look at the satellite observations, uh, sea ice extent in the Arctic, there is an opposite and smaller asymmetry that's observed there. So here I'm showing again the climatology from, from satellite observations. This is the seasonal cycle of sea ice extent in the thick lines, and then the dashed lines show its annual harmonic. So now we have um, this slower retreat period versus a slightly faster growth period, the delta of minus 25 days. Uh, you can also have a look at this over the, the full period, and you can see that there's um, there's a more variability potentially in this, but there's no statistically significant trend over the satellite record. And so I think our findings kind of recast the question in a new light, whereas we had many studies that were questioning why the Antarctic had this rapid retreat phase versus the, the, the longer ice advance. Um, previous studies and ourselves included started by asking, you know, why is this behavior happening? Why the difference to the Arctic? But because uh, we found that it has this very simple driver, uh, it kind of turns the question around and suggests that the, the more mysterious hemisphere here is actually the Arctic. Why isn't the Arctic similarly asymmetric as the Antarctic? And when you look back at the, the geographical differences, it's, it's perhaps not surprising that it's a much harder place to understand. There's, um, there's this land that directly uh, blocks the expansion of the sea ice, and so potentially like looking at the just the seasonal cycle of sea ice extent isn't going to give you a really good handle on the overall seasonality of the sea ice. Maybe you need to think about different metrics. You might also imagine that there are uh, different um, influences in different areas where, besides the direct impact of the land, you might have different temperature evolution over land areas versus ocean areas. You also have uh, ocean heat inflow concentrated in more narrow passages. Uh, there's also hemispheric differences in clouds, with really strong seasonality in clouds in the Arctic, differences in snow properties, and, and um, I can think of a, a few different other properties that, that might, um, might mean that we have a, a more different seasonality in the Arctic. But then also when we look at the, um, the CMIP-6 models, so this is, um, this is the figure I showed before of, of uh, Delta, the seasonality in the CNF6 models in the Antarctic, which are pretty consistent with one another and um, agree well with the observations. In the Arctic, uh, the observations are down here, the orange cross, um, and this is the multi model mean. There's much poorer agreement with the observations, and there's also more intermodal spread, suggesting that if the CNF models aren't really able to capture this mechanism, it might really be quite hard to understand. I think there might be quite a few different processes going on that make this a much more subtle question uh, for the Arctic versus the Antarctic. So, to summarize, um, I talked about three different studies that I've been involved in relating to Antarctic sea ice. Uh, the first was a, an evaluation of the, the new latest couple of climate models and their representation of Antarctic sea ice, and we found that in those models, compared to previous generations, there have been modest improvements. Um, but that uh, the simulation of sea ice, in particular sea ice trends, are compromised by the high climate sensitivity in those models. Uh, in the second part, um, when nudging towards observed winds, we find that a, a fully coupled climate model, the CSM1, uh, does a really good job of capturing the observed variability of sea ice and the regional distribution of sea ice concentration trends. And then when we additionally nudge that model towards the observed SSTs north of the sea ice edge, we have uh, sea ice area trends that are much closer to the observed weekly positive value. Um, so I think this uh, highlights both the winds and the, the thermodynamic um, uh, drivers of, of uh, the model observation difference. 
And then in the third part, we investigated the cause of asymmetry in the seasonal cycle of Antarctic sea ice, uh, which is a, a strong asymmetry uh, of about 51 days. And we found essentially that we should expect asymmetry in the seasonal cycle of Antarctic sea ice based simply on the seasonal cycle of the top of atmosphere insulation. And um, we uh, found that we could work our way down to this very simple idealized model based on the results that we found from the more complex GCMs. And then by stripping this complexity up down to a very simple equation that, um, that revealed this very simple behavior based just on the solar insulation. And so we find this explanation to be, uh, it's been uh, not really discussed in previous studies that focused on the enigmatic uh, retreat of Antarctic sea ice and really I think turns the question around or highlighting a new one, um, why isn't the Arctic sea ice extent similarly asymmetric? Okay, so uh, here are the uh, references for those three studies um, and I'd like to thank again all of my co-authors who've been involved uh, with this and um, with that I will end and then have to take any questions. Thank you. So you've all been lying awake at night, wondering why the Antarctic was anti-symmetric and asymmetric, and you always ask the wrong question. Um, okay, Evan. Yeah, uh, I was wondering, is there any parameterization at all in the idealized model for um, like non-solid ice, uh, like what, what you're looking at right now on the screen? Oh, like, um, you mean when there's, uh, in each grid cell, you have open water areas versus Sea ice. Yeah. Okay. No. Each each grid cell is just 100% sea ice or, or not sea ice. Okay. Yeah. So so even without that that kind of um, we're not really representing that that concentration. You are. It's not very like finely. Uh, it's not very. It's not represented very high resolution. Mm -hmm. um, but even with that simple representation, you can still capture. Um, a large part of the observed seasonal cycle. <coughs> Would it be difficult to put in some sort of parameterization? Like, I don't know, maybe that's a really complex question, but could you like build up the model just a little bit more and then see what changes if you do have something? Yeah. What's the, there be a percentage of ice covering so that you have to I think that's something that you thought about, right? When you were writing this model. Uh, <clears throat> it depends on what question you're asking, right? Mm -hmm. You need a, I, I mean, you can adjust that model or, or models like that at, at, at finitum, right, as, as you wish and see fit. But it has to be the right model for the right question, right? And this was yeah. such a large scale hemispheric question that you we didn't don't really to do care. That. Yeah, yeah, you don't really care about Frasen and Greece and Nihilus yeah. and all that. Yeah, it was really interesting for me to work with such a simple model because I've usually worked with much more complex models. And um, I found that it's really easy to run. It's very like cheap and fast. You can do a lot of things with it, but you have to think for a very long time about whether you're using it in a way that makes sense and whether it's really appropriate. And I really think for this, because of basically because of what we found in the GCM, that it did make sense to use this model and then try and understand the, the very simple physics that was happening. Thank you. Yes, in the back. Uh, so the fact that you can predict the delta. six models in the Arctic perform a lot better. And I, I think, you know, I, sh I showed that figure to kind of contrast with the Antarctic, but I think really it's not, this delta is not necessarily a very good metric for the Arctic because it is just such a more complicated system and it really is limited by the land. And um, yeah, I was a little bit surprised that though that it doesn't, it doesn't seem to be that well represented. It doesn't seem to capture the, the observations that well, but I, um, yeah, I haven't had a chance to look more into that, but I, I hope to be able to understand more about the Arctic uh, seasonality. Well done. 
Yeah, I was thinking about the same thing that why isn't the purple and gold in the Arctic? And I remember Hannah's talk about like how how fresh water mm -hmm. is is like you know incorporated in these models. Could it be because of that that they're not well represented? Is is that you know the the water transport happening underneath? Is that, is, that could be the reason. Yeah, I mean, it's. I think it's maybe a possibility. I don't know whether the models behave consistently in terms of they don't behave consistently. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean they obviously have sea ice biases there too. I my intuition is that land ocean yeah that 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 makes a lot of sense to me. I was I was thinking, well, what about in the Arctic? And then you showed it anyway, and I was like, perfect. <laughs> so, because that was exactly my thought was that it would be because of the land and the lack of ocean, if you will. <laughs> There's a question from the live stream. Karen Russ asks, how does the technique of wind nudging work? Um, so each each um, each six hours, there's, there's, there's a module for it in CSM. So it's not something that we developed. It's it's um, available within CSM. But uh, every six hours, you, you compute the difference between the uh, the, the, the modeled uh, wind field and the reanalysis wind field, and then relax over the six hours towards the, the reanalysis value. And we did this, we did that um, above the boundary layer, but otherwise at all levels in the atmosphere. But it's definitely becoming quite a common technique. A lot of um, modeling centers are using this. Great. Now you talked about top of the atmosphere radiation budgets being a key factor. Is that the effect of the perihelion? Uh, in terms of the difference, there's, there's a small there's a, there's a small difference between the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere because of the eccentricity of Earth's orbit. But the inherent the inherent kind of behavior is just because we're at the pole and the insulation is very concentrated in the summer and there's not very much going on in the winter. So it's that um, kind of very simple uh, behavior that's driving the asymmetry. But then, yeah, there are differences. The, the orbital parameters. So, so if you were to symmetrize the solar constant um, and, and get rid of that orbital difference, would that asymmetry go away? Because perhaps some of the other stuff are feedbacks from that same thing. No, it's it's the same for, for both um, because it's, ju it's just because we have a lot of insulation in the summer and not very much in the winter. That's that's really all it is. So you have you will have changes to exactly how strong of an asymmetry you get based on based on orbital differences, but the, the behavior is just because we have overnight and very strong. So I think if you if you got rid of the um, the tilt of the axis of the earth. Yes. But if you got rid of the polar night, then you would get rid of that That's that's well if you, if you make the what what triggers it? The orbit of the sun perfect circle you would get rid of a lot of that, wouldn't you? No, yeah, that's the thing. Only the differences between the Arctic and the Antarctic, you would get rid of those differences right. in the idealized model. Mm -hmm. But but the asymmetry on the seasonal um, cycle is because of the tilt of the Earth, and that you're, for a while, you're in the, in the shadow of the sun. And you can't go below zero, so yeah, that's naturally not going to fit in the first time on. That's exactly, yeah. Oh, yeah, I, was was something. I, what it yeah was. I, I really like the energy balance work. It's really cool to use this kind of energy balance model for this problem. Yeah, so and we were stoked to get this, you know, into next year. So, like, yeah, how can you see an idealized model like that? Yeah, yeah I was going to ask about something else, and now I forgot what it was. Um, yeah, I, I had a follow up question on the wind nudging part. Yeah. You said that the nudging was done above the boundary layer. Yeah. And to me, it would like, I thought that the winds might be affecting the surface as well. I don't understand that why it was good just a couple of the Well, we just we did it. We didn't want to constrain too much. We wanted to because if you if you nudge right down to the surface, then you really do kind of set a lot of uh, the properties of the surface. Although we do find that when we nudge above the boundary layer, that you still that does exert a strong constraint down. Um, so, so it's like nudging closer to the surface. And that's that's what you meant by saying that nudging above the. Oh, sorry. Say again. I just got confused when you say like you if you nudge the wind above boundary layer. So did you consider like surface to boundary layer or like above the 
so, the, so the, the nudging, the reduction to the, the reanalysis was above 850 hectopascals. So we okay. just applied it above that, but not below, because we wanted to let the stuff that was happening down there evolve freely. Okay. But it does turn out that when we apply it above, that there's still a lot of that. It's, it's, what happens at the surface is still quite constrained by doing it above the ground. Okay. I remember what I was going to ask. So there's mid latitude SST biases. Yeah. Do you have any idea where those are coming from? Yeah, I think a lot of I think a lot of people are looking into that at the moment. Um, and uh, in terms, um, quite a lot of people are talking about the early connections across uh, the yeah, Pacific and between the Southern Ocean. And I think well, you were you were you did the nudging of the the winds and that helped some, and then you did the nudging of the mid latitude SSTs and that brought you outside of the large ensemble yeah, yeah. range. Yeah. So that kind of means that. Those are probably biases in the model. Yeah. So the I, SSTs. Yeah. So I think. Um, well, the, the two things that jump out to me for the Southern Ocean are the the role of fresh water from the Antarctic ice sheet, which isn't generally included in the CMIP models, so that might have a role. And then also the the eddies. Um, so there was a, a recent, a very recent paper actually that looked at Antarctic sea ice in the Southern Ocean in, in two um, uh, different resolution configurations, and the very high resolution one had a very different representation of heat transport when it permitted eddies across the ACC. Um, and so they, they suggested that when um, in the in the CMIP models that are much coarser resolution, we're not capturing the details of, of, of those eddies and that that plays a role in, in not capturing the, the observed uh, SST trends. Okay. But I think it's still very much an open question. There's a lot of, also with the freshwater, there's been a lot of um, model dependent findings where people put fresh water into the models in terms of the response that they get. And um, yeah, and then other people have been looking at the observed kind of teleconnections between the Pacific and the Southern Ocean. So I think there's there's a lot to a lot more to, to understand there that we, we don't have a clear picture of yet. Thank you. All right, let's uh, thank Leslie once more.